episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode, a double header of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in true crime. It seems like I was just saying this an hour and a half ago, and in fact, I was. But welcome back. Glad you could be with us. Uh, there is breaking news in the uh, Dan Markell Adelson story, this crime, this murder case that's been going on uh, since 2014, nine plus years, and the twists and turns are still coming. Uh, welcoming to the show tonight, our best guest and a man who stepped in last moment. So I own, um, you see the name on the screen, Stephen Webster. He is a stand-up guy, met him up in Tallahassee, and he practices law with Louis Baptiste. They have a firm called Webster and Baptiste, and uh, Stephen was Dan Markell's divorce attorney, and Stephen actually testified. Uh, Stephen, before we even get into this, um, there's been some time that has passed since the conviction. Obviously, we all know that Donna was arrested. This has been a lot to absorb. How's it been for you? It's, a, it's been a relief. You know, um, you wait year after year. And, you, you know, in my heart of hearts, I always felt like I knew who was responsible for what happened to Dan. And so, you know, after so many years go by, you really start to become dis disillusioned and you start to wonder whether or not it's going to happen. And, you know, obviously it was wonderful that Tallahassee Police Department and the FBI and FDLE, all those folks in the state attorney's office, and that they were able to track down, you know, the gunman and Katie and her the relationship there. But, you know, making the pieces, the dots finally connect to the Adelsons was really what mattered, I think, to most people um, who were affected by the crime. And so to see Charlie go down um, and finally be held accountable and have that jury slam it, slam that door shut behind him, that cell door shut behind him, it felt really, really good. And, uh, you know, obviously you're hoping that that more arrests will follow. Um, and then when it happened so quick with Donna and under the circumstances that she was arrested, you know, I, I think a lot of us feel vindicated that, you know, we're carrying that kind of that torch um, for justice. And, you know, we feel like the uh, road to justice is finally unwinding in front of us and is opening up. And I see a path uh, to, to obtaining, I think, full justice. Uh, by the way, Lewis, Stephen's partner, is scheduled to join. He's teaching a class tonight. Uh, he may pop on in a few moments. He's a great guy. Um, really interesting to listen to because he's he's so um, high energy and passionate about <laughs> criminal defense, and that is an understatement. Uh, Suzanne Schultz says Donna needs a doll to help her cope. Maybe that is the case. We're going to get into this emergency motion. Um, Steve, I know I asked you this when I was up in Tallahassee, but just – just take us back, because, again, uh, in the last story we were doing with Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, uh, that's the murder of some young children as well as adults. Horrific crime here. Um, two young kids are affected and Dan Markell lost his life. When this crime happened, you were Dan's div divorce attorney. Where were you when you got the call that he was murdered and what was the emotion um, in the ensuing days? You know, so I was really representing him post-divorce. Um, it's, it's a slight distinction, uh, but it was the 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 litigation was still flowing from the dissolution. But I had a uh, we we were on the road. <clears throat> we were going to file uh, some requests for admissions the day that he was murdered, and I had made that known to opposing counsel that that was our intent, and that I was going to file it that Friday, and that I felt like you know we were going to really start kind of going down a road that we might not be able to come back from. And so Dan, I had kind of drafted the request, sent them, sent them to Dan the night before, the, the day before. And the plan was he was going to look at them that evening and call me in the morning. He had the boys. So he had, you know, he wanted to do it on his time. And he called me. It was, I believe it was, it was eight o'clock central time. I was in the central time zone. Uh, I was taking my son to a, a baseball tournament. My family was traveling and 
my wife was in the getting ready, getting dressed. The phone rang and it was Dan and my daughters were jumping on the hotel beds back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So I told him, I said, Dan, I can't talk right now. Let me pack up, get the kids fed, get on the road. We'll put a movie on in the car and I'll call you once they settle down. So I told him I would call him at around, I think it was 10 uh, Central, 11 Eastern. Uh, but then shortly before that, we decided that we wanted to make a stop at a mall. So I looked in Google Maps and I saw that there was a mall about 15 minutes away. I told my wife, I said, well, just go there. You can take the kids inside. And while you guys are inside, I'll get on the phone with Dan and we'll finalize uh, these requests. So I called him at, I think it was 1118. Um, if my times are correct here. I know it was about three minutes after he was shot. Um, I found that out later and he didn't answer. And, you know, it was a little bit unusual because Dan would answer even when he was with the boys. Uh, but he would tell me, I'm with the boys. I'll call you back. I mean, that's what you would literally I would literally hear those words. And then, you know, I would understand. Um, and he would call me back. And it was about three hours later. He had not called me back and it was getting closer to the deadline to file. And I told the other attorney I was going to file before five o'clock on Friday if we hadn't heard from them, you know, on some way to try to move towards a, a mutual agreeable, you know, mutually agreeable resolution. And I was uh, with my wife and the phone rang and it was a police officer and a local police officer that I know. And I considered her a friend, had her in my phone by her first name. And um, I had told Dan that I was worried that Wendy would at some point try to, if she got really desperate, uh, would accuse him of hitting her, kicking her or something like that, bring some sort of battery allegation against him in order to try to gain a tactical advantage in the litigation, get an injunction, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I, you know, I don't want you around her anymore. I know you guys still kind of see each other in passing. I don't want that while this is going on. Stay away from her. And the phone rang. I saw the police officer's name. I answered it very casually. Hey, how you doing? You know, I just thought it was just one of those things, just calling random. And uh, she said, how do you know Dan Markell? And I was taken aback by the tone of her voice. And I said, what? And she said, how do you know Dan Markell? And, and she like amped it up. And then all the my mind started to process things. And I she I knew she worked in violent crimes. So I kind of went to the conclusion that Wendy had done what I was afraid she was going to do. And it falsely accused Dan of something. And uh, I said, he's my client. I want to speak to him right now. And she said, you can't do that. I said, no, yes, I can. I am. I actively represent him right now. I want to speak to him right now. And she said, you can't because something really bad has happened. And I can still hear those words. And as soon as she said that, and it sounds preposterous, and in many respects, it probably is because I had never fathomed anything like that. You know, the, what I thought was bad was her falsely accusing him of maybe hitting her or something. You know, you see that from time to time and family law issues. Um, and but I knew at that moment, as soon as she said something really bad has happened, I knew that they killed him. And I know it sounds weird, but I did. It washed over me like a chill. And I spent the, that rest of that afternoon in a daze. We got to the baseball tournament and um, we're around a lot of our, you know, the, the teammates and their mothers and fathers. And I was just in a daze. And so, you know, it it's, it's strange how these things hit you, you know. Um, I never would have probably anticipated um, that I could carry it the way that I have, you know, and, you know, when, when you work in the criminal justice field, you see tragedy all the time. When you work in law, you know, if you work as an attorney, unfortunately, we see tragedy all the time in many shapes, forms and fashions. You know, you see pure evil from time to time, you know, but, you know, you're usually seeing people that have no impulse control or have addiction issues or, you know, anger management issues where they're, they act rash or they make just a really terrible decision on any given night. Um, so I think, you know, there's something about this particular crime to think that what we would all perceive as being erudite, scholarly, reasoned people plot 
the cold-blooded murder of two children, uh, the father of two children that they allegedly hold dear and love. And not only just some father, I mean an exceptional, extraordinary, exquisite father. You'll hear that from people and you'll never understand it unless you saw it. I saw it. And he did inspire me to want to be a better father. And I think I'm a decent father. You know, I think my kids know that I love them. But when Lewis tells you and he'll tell you that, you know, you went to his office and every other law professor will have all their accolades and deservedly so. It's part of the profession. It's part of the esteem of the profession, you know, to have that stuff front and center, especially in a law school setting. But not Dan. He had his kids artwork. You know, when I tell you I would call him, it didn't matter like how important the phone call may be. If he was with his boys and they were doing something and he was engaged with them, he was present with them. And that's why I would get I'm with the boys. I'll call you back, you know. And so to think that that man, that precious gift to those two boys was taken away forever by these erudite, scholarly, reasoned people. It was shocking to my conscience. And I didn't think I could be shocked by anything in the law anymore. I frankly didn't. I'd seen a lot of pretty crazy stuff at that point in my career already. So, yeah, it's um, it's nice to see justice being served. Wow. Uh, this is Don DeQuisto, a friend of the show. This is crushing, and we should all remember this. Life is precious and too short. There was just another mass shooting today uh, in Vegas at UNLV. Three people senselessly lost their lives. It's got to stop. But um this is one of the most uh, poignant descriptions that I have heard. Uh, doesn't surprise me because when you meet Steve Webster in person, um, he's a very engaging guy, um, really good person. Again, I called him last second tonight and said, hey, can you do me a favor? Uh, and he's on here tonight. Um, I know you had to testify in this trial, Steve. I, I don't I don't recall seeing you, but were you there um, for um the reading of the uh, verdict. Were you in the courtroom? No, sir. I wasn't. Um, I may try to go next week, mm -hmm. but I wasn't there for that. I was, I was actually on a, I was out of the country. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was in Greece. And um, strangely enough, a lot of the folks, we went with some friends and family and um, we were all hovered around a computer um, in the evening, different time zones, obviously. So it was dark. And we were hovered around a computer uh, listening to Georgia's closing. And I just have to say, we I've known Georgia a lot of years. My wife and I both worked with her at the state attorney's office, practiced with her. You know, and she was always a fantastic attorney. Um, but I thought her closing argument was one of the one of I thought it was her 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 magnum opus. <laughs> it was uh, it was just phenomenal when she had the still image of Dan on the screen and was talking about how they wanted to make him disappear and it faded out. We all gasped. Um, and uh, I just want to, I really want to say thank you to George Kaplan and Sarah Dugan, um, Jason, Newland, the people at the state attorney's office for the great work they did. Yeah. It was a team effort on their part. And that was a very chilling image when his image in fact faded out. Um, what about uh, when you heard the words guilty um, on all counts, what, what was your reaction? You're in Greece. Uh, here's Louis Baptiste. Uh, Louis, we're just talking to Steve Webster, your law partner, about uh, the the conviction now. But Steve, when you heard the words "guilty" and you're in Greece, uh, half a world away, what was your reaction after all these years? You know, I knew it, so it was more of just uh, I was just kind of relishing the moment as as it was unfolding. I think Charlie knew. I you know, you, there's that moment where he leans over to you know to his attorney and whisper something and I'm, I'm having been there at the table in situations like that i felt like i know what he asked and what he asked was what do you think and anybody i think who's done some trial work knows with that fast of a jury uh, verdict that that short of a deliberation period and with the evidence that was presented that a short verdict was not favorable for charlie adelson and uh so i'm i'm in my, my head I imagine that Dan said, this isn't good. I think he was probably honest because as an attorney at times like that, you just have to be honest with your client. There's a time to sugarcoat and there's a time not to. And that was the moment that Charlie, like, he kind of did one of those things in his chair 
And uh, so I certainly knew what the verdict was. So it was, it, there wasn't a whole lot of anticipation other than just watching it. So I was just watching his face um, and honestly, just very grateful. Um, Lewis, I was just talking to Steve, who was really eloquently describing, uh, you know, when he got the news about Dan, uh, you were his, you were Dan Markell's law student. Uh, let's just start there. Um, just, I, I don't know if all these people saw you the last time you're super engaging. Um, just describe Dan, the person I wasn't going to even go down this road tonight, but just Steve has put me in this place because, uh, he talked about it really beautifully. Tell me about um, Dan Markell, the professor, and your experience with him. Oh, man. Dan Markell, the professor, is a intelligent person, but more importantly, I think his intelligence speaks for itself. But every time I get a chance to talk about him, I talk about the father that he was and how much he loved his, how much he loved his two boys. Um, in our class, uh, intro to litigation class, criminal law, tough subject, hardcore cases hardcore facts. Um, unfortunately, we were talking about murders and crimes, like the crimes that were committed against him. And still, despite all of that, he always found a way to interweave his sons and their names into our lesson. And so, you know, it, the fact that he would interweave his two boys and their names, which I remember to this day, all these years later, all these days later, all these minutes later, I still remember their names because he said them so often. What that told me was that even when he was lecturing and teaching, at all times, he was thinking about his kids. He was thinking about his two sons. Even when he was talking to us about mens rea and actus reus and those criminal law components, he was still thinking about his two sons. You know, and that's, you know, for it was never a he never stopped being a parent. He, he wasn't a parent when he was home and then not being a parent when he was in class. He was a parent at all times. Um intellectually, you know, he was second to none. He was a preeminent scholar in criminal law, a preeminent scholar in white collar crime, a preeminent scholar in sports law. And so you're talking about a preeminent scholar in multiple fields, and that's rare. Usually professors specialize in one thing, and they're great in that. He was, you know, a specialist in multiple areas, and that's not common. Yeah. And, and Lewis, um, I asked Steve this just a moment ago before you got on too. obviously so much has transpired uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, did you ever think that we would get this conviction of Charlie Adelson and then literally one week to the day an arrest of Don Adelson? How have you absorbed uh, all these recent developments? And so if you know, I, the last time I was on your show, we talked, I think it was probably I was on your show right before Georgia was going to do her cross. So it was, at yeah. the, it was towards the end of the trial. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think one of the users asked, they asked such a great question. They said, uh, you know, what's going to happen next? And I, and I responded and I said, look, you can bet your bottom dollar that, you know, Donna's being watched. And that was before the conviction. And I, and I didn't have the benefit of knowing about these horrible recording jail calls that Charlie was making. But, you know, it was always my impression that given the gravity of this case, that uh, Georgia Kaplman was going to make sure that Donna was under surveillance, whether or not what kind of surveillance net was around her, I'm not sure, but I knew for sure there was some form of surveillance that was around her. She was being monitored in some way. And so I was in court with Judge Everett. Um, the morning that that morning, uh, the morning that he signed those warrants, I was I was in court with Judge Everett that morning. And so I was in court for another morning when the grand jury was meeting and he had to step off the bench to go to the grand jury's meeting because, of course, those are secret. But um, I have no doubt that her case was being presented because, of course, she has to be indicted. Um, and so for, for me, I knew this process would work fast. Um, I think that Georgia made the beautiful decision. And, you know, it's been a debate. Do you indict all together or do you indict one at a time? That's been a debate that's been going around across the world and across the country on shows like yours, but I mean, no shows like yours, but shows that want to be like yours. Um, <laughs> they've been uh, talking about whether or not you indict one or you indict three, you know, but I think that Georgia made the great decision in indicting one at a time. I mean, th this entire case has been one at a time and that's, and it's worked beautifully. And so the old idiom is that if it isn't broke, don't fix it. And I think that's a perfect example. Um, she'll take Donna out and hopefully in prosecuting Charlie, 
we saw all the breadcrumbs that led to Donna. And so now I'm hoping that in this trial in prosecuting Donna, we'll see a lot of breadcrumbs that might lead to Wendy. Uh, these are two amazing guests. We put this together literally in five seconds. And thankfully, uh, Steve and Lewis are stand up guys and offered to do this. Um, Steve, is this the end of the line as it pertains to justice, do you think? Or it, it seems like the state is really on a roll here, like there's momentum, almost like in a sporting event. Um, I've I've talked to people. My own mother thinks that Harvey is culpable in this. So many people think Wendy is culpable. Uh, what do you think comes next? Uh, or is this the end of the line? You know, it's tough to say, um, you know, there's no doubt that this, the stronger case is against Donna. There is no doubt about that. You know, her phone call with Charlie after the bump, um, where she talks about it probably involves the two of us is obviously very strong evidence against her and for any of the others that may be suspected of being involved, they could use that obviously as a shield against any allegations for, again, you know, brought against them. But I wouldn't bet against Georgia Kappelman. I wouldn't bet against any of the people on that team. Um, they clearly have had a plan. It's for, like Lewis said, the breadcrumbs that they've seemed to call out of every case uh, roll over to the next prosecution. So I, uh, I'm optimistic that, that we haven't seen the, the last shoe drop. Um, you know, obviously with Donna boarding a flight with a one-way ticket to Vietnam, that, that forced the state's hand on, on the timing of her arrest. Um, so perhaps they were actually planning on doing something a little bit more adventurous, you know, but, but they were waiting for the timing to be right. And that was lost uh, by virtue of Donna's uh, attempt to flee the country. Um, but I'm optimistic, Joel. Uh, like I said, I won't bet against Georgia or the state attorney's office here. You know, Jack Campbell, they've all really put their heart and soul in it. I went up to the office. I used to work in that office. I went up to the office <clears throat> during the trial. And I mean, they had a war room in there that I've never seen before, you know, and uh, the Second Circuit, you know, we're not small potatoes here, but we're certainly not Dade, you know, county. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not. When, when you say a war room, I mean, p people love to know what's going on in the, on the inside. Can you describe it a little bit without giving yeah. away, uh, you know, information? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't privy to anything sensitive in there, uh, but I could see it. Um, and it, it was an old filing filing room where we used to store all of the old felony files, which, you know, that that's gone by the wayside now. Um, so we don't have that was just empty space, dead space at this point. And it's a large room. It's not a small room. It was a very large file room. And they had TVs multiple TVs up monitoring the trial live time with several people in there, obviously watching and consulting and trying to anticipate, you know, where, where cross may need to go, where direct may need to go. I'm just, I'm surmising here, but that's what I'm guessing they were doing. They were watching it and they weren't watching it just for grins. They were working. Um, and it was impressive and uh, really encouraging for me. Mm. Uh, just a reminder, you see on the screen here, uh, Ruth Markell is going to be in South Florida, uh, not far from where I live, uh, and, and I'm going to be moderating a conversation called Perspectives on Trial Life. This is going to be Wednesday, December 20th, uh, 2023. I'm going to tweet this out on my Twitter handle at Podcast STS and on my Instagram page at Surviving the Survivor. Uh, tickets are on sale for this event, and uh, Ruth will be the centerpiece. Uh, you will have Dennis Murphy, a Dateline correspondent who covered this for Dateline NBC, and Dave Arenberg, who is a best guest and a best guy, is a good guy, uh, the Florida State Attorney out of Palm Beach County. So if you're in the area, uh, please come and support the Markel family. Uh, Ruth, as I said, will be there. And uh, for those of you who could not make it, uh, the COE and I are actually talking to Jafco, that, uh, who's hosting this event, um, tomorrow, and we were going to try to get a recorded version for all of you, but that is uh, December 20th, as you see there. Uh, Lewis, next week, big week again. Um, it seems like things are con nine, nine plus years. It was like, you know, slow with a trial here, trial there. Now things seem to be happening fast and furious. On Monday, it was now changed. Donna Adelson is going to have her arraignment. Uh, for those who don't know how Tallahassee works or how an arraignment works, Walk us through this. What are we going to expect 
uh, to see with Don Adelson at this point. And so it, it's going to be a pretty formal procedure in the sense of um, I think that she's going to be brought to court. The judge is going to announce the charges against her. Her attorney is going to waive the reading of the charges formally enter a written pleas of not guilty, a demand for discovery. Um, and she's already filed a notice of appearance. And so it's going to be a pretty formal, quick proceeding. Normally, I think the fact that this motion has been filed, though, is obviously going to change the tone and the nature of it, what would be a pretty simple arraignment. So I think now that the court's going to have to deal with this motion, and so it's going to make arraignment a lot different. Usually at arraignment, we don't have, you know, this is not a normal motion. And so I know we're talking the question about arraignment, but I think that this motion being filed is going to change the entire nature of what arraignment is supposed to be. Uh, and we're going to go through this motion kind of step by step in a minute. So that's the arraignment. Um, Steve, if you want to add, uh, add anything to that. And then Tuesday, we've got sentencing for Charlie Adelson, all but sure uh, to be sentenced to uh, state prison for the rest of his natural life. What what are we going to see there? Um. Not much. I mean, you know, there's no discretion here. Uh, so it's it's mandatory life. Um, you know, he, the, the judge is going to pronounce the sentence and bang the gavel and they're going to remand him to state custody. And I suspect that given, you know, it's, it's one of the things we'll talk about in the motion. But, you know, when you have funny thing about a county jail, county jail has to be a maximum security prison. And it's also got to house the guy that is caught driving without a license. Right. Um, overnight. You, and so basically, you have to treat every inmate like they're a maximum security threat in a jail because you have the whole gamut. So it's very difficult to have um, one set of security. You know, there's no really such thing as minimum security when you're in a county jail because you have to presume that everybody that's walking around could be facing life in prison or may have already been sentenced to life in prison or, you know, maybe worse. And um, so I suspect that DOC won't. They won't dilly dally as far as sending a bus uh, to take Charlie to probably the Northwest Florida Reception Center, uh, which is where um, new prisoners are taken in Florida <laughs> and processed and classified. Um, and, you know, I'm thankfully I've never had to walk in the shoes of anybody who's gone through that process, but I've heard that it's a very unpleasant process. Um, and how, how long are they there for? I think it's about two weeks. It depends, I think, on the classification process and also probably security and things like that. But I mean, it's, you know, you're looking at days, you know, at a minimum, you're going to spend days there. And I think part of that is to make sure that every newly arriving inmate understands exactly where they are, that you're in prison now and you're not a person, you're a number. And you're, you know, you are at the beck and call of the state of Florida and they want to make sure to the extent that you have any illusions about, you know, where you are and what your status is that, you know, those illusions are erased and um, that you're ready to go to prison and serve your time and, you know, hopefully abide by the rules. So it's a, uh, that's what I expect. You know, when you're, when you have these sentencing where there's no, there's no discretion, it's a mandatory deal you know, the court's really just not going to waste much time and energy on it. They're going to announce the sentence and they're going to move on. You know, the, the, the victim impact statements will probably, you know, be either read into the record. I think it's my understanding that um, the victim's advocates who do a wonderful job here in the Second Circuit, by the way, um, will probably read those in. Uh, some people may present in person to read some uh, and that, you know, there'll be some time there and obviously some emotion there. Uh, that will be certainly difficult. But as far as the pronouncement of sentence, it's going to be quick. And effective and permanent wow wow that's chilling uh, i i just talked about this on the last show i'm not going to harp on it again but i don't understand how life in state prison is not a deterrent for people how they don't think about this because i cannot think of a worse fate than that um lewis uh stephen was just talking about these victim impact statements i know the markels are not going to be there in person by the way someone suggested sending donna a copy of ruth's book it's actually a great idea. Um, maybe someone at STS could do that. I heard she's uh, looking for reading material. But these victim impact statements, the Markells are not going to be there. Um, I think they're going to maybe appear via Zoom. Uh, how emotional will will it get, do you think? And do we hear from the defendant in this case? And so I think that um, I think that it's going to get extremely emotional. 
And I think that, you know, Judge Everett's a people's judge. And so I judge Everett's going to want to make sure that we saw it during the trial. You know, he wanted at all points to give, you know, uh, deferential treatment and decorum in the courtroom. So I think he's going to make sure that there's adequate time uh, for the victim impact statements to be read. I think that he's going to make it he's going to make he's going to do everything in his power to make sure that even if Ruth can't be there, that, you know, her statement is still felt in the courtroom um, and that it still fills the room. I think that, you know, he'll get the best courtroom with the best sound, with the best video. I think he'll go through all those steps to make sure that even though they're not present, because, of course, it's not easy to get back and forth, that they still have their opportunity to be heard and for the court to feel what they're going through. So I think that it's going to be extremely emotional. I think that Webster said it best. I think that sentencing is going to be is going to be extremely quick. Um, but I think that the victim impact statement, Judge Everett is going to make sure that they get to say every word, every comma. You know, sometimes we see it where there's a time limit. I don't expect any time limit to be given here. Um, I expect, you know, it, to the extent she wanted to read a, a chapter of her book, I think he would allow it. I expect him to give her every second that she deserves because we know everyone knows that she deserves it, you know, for what she's been through and what she's going through every day, because I imagine the pain doesn't stop for her. It's ongoing. Um, and she deserves the time. I think Judge Everett's going to give it to her. Uh, I know the pain doesn't stop for the Markel family. I'm in touch with uh, the father, Phil, um, Shelly, the daughter, and of course, Ruth. Uh, Dwayne Harris says it best. Dwayne's a new friend of the show. See him all the time. Love having him here. Stephen and Lewis are great guests, Joel. Uh, thank you uh, and thank them. Uh, quick programming note. We're going to cover um, the hearing, the arraignment on Monday of Don Adelson live, and we're going to have coverage. Um, obviously, uh, Tim Jansen has been doing that, doing that, and I'm hoping to have him on, but he may have a conflict. Um, so we'll figure it out if he can't do it. And then Tuesday, uh, we're going to cover the sentencing live, and we'll do shows each night. Um, on what we, you know, ex what we see and uh, transpire in the courtroom that day. So make sure you, uh, you know, tune in both those days, Monday and Tuesday. It's going to be all Dan Markell, all Adelson, all day long uh, as we break that down. And uh, keep an eye on Twitter at Podcast STS on Instagram at Surviving the Survivor. Now on to this uh, filing of this emergency uh, motion. Uh, Stephen, can you just, for those who don't know, what does this mean that this was filed today? And it sounds like it's going to be taken up um, on Monday. Uh, this, we'll get to it in a minute, but if you could just explain that first, what, what is an emergency motion and what is it your, what is your understanding about why it was filed and how does it proceed from here? Well, you know, it, it kind of, the, the, the main purpose of it here, the, you know, the Hail Mary is that she would get released with on some sort of house arrest. And that's, I don't, I think the chances of that are next to none. Um, you know, interestingly enough, kind of given her age and maybe some of the other things, she may have had a sympathetic argument to the court if she hadn't, they hadn't caught her on a, a runway with a one-way ticket to Vietnam. And, uh, you know, pretrial detention in America is in our, our system of jurisprudence is not intended to be penal in nature. It, uh, you know, pretrial, Conditions, uh, release, bail um, is only served, is only designed to serve two purposes, to ensure that somebody appears uh, when required in court and to protect the community in those situations where the person presents some sort of ongoing threat or risk to the community. Um, so here, you know, when you're talking the, the, the higher the stakes here, life sentence, mandatory life sentence, then obviously, uh, the second component becomes, or, or the first component becomes much more important, uh, the likelihood of flight, uh, the the ability to ensure and guarantee that people will appear as ordered by the court. Uh, so, you know, she doomed herself uh, by buying that one-way ticket and uh, try, attempting to go to Vietnam, as, as far as I'm concerned, with regard to any, any potential uh, for release, uh, pretrial release, house arrest. So that part of the motion is just, you know, the, the lawyer has to do her job, you know, and, and you, you throw it out there and you hope. Um, and obviously the client probably loves seeing that or at least hoping, having that hope. Um, but, you know, the, the other parts of the motion, it, it kind of moves into the uh, transportation issues. And, and that kind of goes back to the point I was making with respect to county jails, having to treat every inmate like their maximum security. 
Um, in this case, when you're transporting an actual maximum security inmate, you know, she's facing life in prison. Um, you know, we call it diesel therapy in the business. Um, sometimes the worst thing you can do is get caught in a foreign jurisdiction. You know, you're much better off if you can turning yourself in where you're going to be housed uh, because the trip uh, from wherever you are arrested to your ultimate destination is never going to be a pleasant one. They're going to have you locked down in very un uncomfortable positions to ensure that you don't pose any danger or risk of flight or danger to the, the people that are transporting you in a very unsecure situation. Um, so that part of the motion doesn't trouble me. The other stuff where she talks about the treatment in the jail that, you know, that if true, and I, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to place any uh, veracity in anything that Donna Adelson says, um, especially when it comes secondhand hearsay to her attorney who puts throughout the motion that she can't talk to her client. So I'm, you know, really perplexed as to how the attorney derived all of this information from a client she has not spoken to. Uh, but, e but if true, then certainly a lot of those things are troublesome. And certainly the, the lack of access to the attorney is troublesome. But, you know, Lewis will tell you, you know, that is a reality that the attorneys face all the time when they have clients that don't have bail. Yeah. And you're trying to prepare for trial. Uh, so, you know, I think really, um, if there's any truth to those allegations, I suspect that Judge Everett will address them and it will be known that, you know, some arrangements will be made. But, you know, relationships are important in every environment. And the attorney, I don't know if she's been up here and she's actually gone out to the jail and tried to meet people to, to figure out who it is she needs to call when she wants to talk to her client and how that can be arranged. But, you know, those things will get ironed out. I don't think there's any chance Donna's getting out, uh, but those things I do believe will get ironed out. And to the extent that there is any truth behind it, I absolutely believe that Judge Everett will get to the bottom of it. And uh, the lawyers, Maricel Descalzo from down here in Miami-Dade County, uh, she is representing Donna, at least for the time being. But Stephen raises a really interesting point because the complaint we're about to see in this motion is that she couldn't speak to any of her attorneys. So how their attorneys know all this information to then file the motion. Steve, the other thing is, I mean, what kind of a dumb, moronic, idiotic move was it to buy a one-way ticket? I mean, at least if they bought a round trip ticket, they could say, Hey, we're going on vacation. They, you know, they're, they were free at that point, but I mean, consciousness of guilt, it just screams that doesn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I, I the flight, the, the trip itself, like you said, was, <laughs> It was, on, you know, it was a, it was a bridge weight was three bridges too far. But then to buy a one way ticket, like Lewis had said, he's like, you know, come on, you know, I, we you know, we all like to think they have some money and maybe they don't. I'm sure, you know, this is all taking a financial toll on them, this whole process. But uh, scrape the money together and hire a private plane. I mean, I mean you know, <laughs> do something and certainly don't tell Charlie over the phone. Uh, yeah, Sm I, you know, sometimes smart people make dumb mistakes, but who knows how smart they are. Uh, let's get into this motion here. The first one, uh, th th these are basically excerpts and paraphrases from the actual motion, which was nine pages. Again, an emergency motion filed on Donna Adelson's behalf. Lewis, this first one talks about TGK. That's Turner Guilford Knight. That's an infamous jail here in Miami, Dade County. It is no joke. It says that Donna was put in the psychiatric unit placed in an isolation cell with a small sink, mattress on the floor, blanket, and a toilet, did not have access to any clothes, cups, silverware, books, blankets, or toiletries, and was only permitted to shower once. Um, is this jail life or is this unfair? They're basically here setting up a precedent to talk about how much worse it is actually in Tallahassee. But what about these bullet points here? Uh, being placed in this isolation cell. Um, you know, initially, I think there was a suicide watch. But what do you make of this? I think it's standard. You know, I, I literally just uh, this afternoon, I was at Florida State Hospital, um, which is the hospital in Tallah. We call it Chattahoochee. But it's the hospital um, located in Chattahoochee, Florida, that deals with um, in North Florida, all of the inmates who have um, serious psychological issues. Uh, that's where they go. That's where their house securely. And I was there today um, for an inmate who a client who's not too different from this situation. He was, he had all these boat, he had these same bullet points. I say that to say that, look, this is standard being placed in an isolation cell, small sink, mattress on the floor. Um, this is all standard, not having access to any clothes. That's a weapon. A cup can be a weapon. Silverware can be a weapon. A book can be a weapon. Um, blanket that you can tear thread on can be a weapon. 
And so uh, prior to them conducting a psychiatric evaluation, which is what they did, you have to treat the inmate like every single thing is a weapon. And like, they're, especially in this case, that if they can use any of those weapons to take their own life, they will. And so these conditions are not for the protection of the staff in these cases. Uh, these conditions are solely for the protection of Donna because there's serious risk that she might harm herself. And so this is standard and none of this is problematic at all uh, to me whatsoever. Uh, it's unfortunate for her, you know, or for any person, but I think it's necessary when there's a real risk that a person might do harm to themselves. Mm. Uh, Stephen, this is kind of in your wheelhouse as, uh, you know, having represented Dan as a post-divorce attorney from Evan Duke. Question, do you think Wendy's children are safe given that Donna, you know, it implied suicide stated, I think is the word that they're writing here, stated suicide before the arrest and Wendy is unstable. Uh, I can tell you, I, I know people down here that know the Adelsons and uh, from what I'm hearing, she's um, exponentially more stressed right now, having a hard time taking care of the two children. Is there danger potentially being posed to Ben and Lincoln? Does there need to be some sort of welfare check? What do you, what is your thought? Well, um, obviously with Donna, I think they're safe from Donna. Uh, I don't anticipate her having any unfettered access to those children anytime soon, thankfully. Uh, certainly her comments about, you know, the contemplations of suicide, uh, I think would have absolutely necessitated and mandated a welfare check. Um, I hope they're safe. Um, you know, I, I imagine that Wendy Adelson is absolutely feeling as much stress as she probably thought she could ever endure. Um, but you know, all I can say is I pray that the children are safe. I think we all pray for that. And, um, man, when you think of those two young boys and, and you know, I say this too, uh, other people in this case, uh, have children, including Charlie Adelson, including Katie McBanawa, including Lewis Rivera, um, a lot of tragedy here all around because none of those kids deserve it. Uh, you know, whether their parents are criminals or not, the kids do not deserve that, but are experiencing uh, the repercussions of it all. So this is a part of the motion. We'll go through these steps. Uh, transport. This is what Stephen was talking about. The transport from Miami up to Tallahassee. In the motion, uh, Donna's attorney states that Donna was in the back of the vehicle with no water. Donna tried to flag officers because she needed water and a restroom stop. Approximately four to five hours into the trip, officers checked on her. Donna was shaking, dehydrated, and unable to stand up or move. Officers called paramedics at the rest stop. Lewis, uh, your take on this part of the motion. And do we, as Stephen just said, do we have to be kind of cognizant or aware of the veracity of all these statements? Could some of this stuff, and listen, I know lawyers have jobs to do. Um, and I'm by no means trying to throw anyone under the bus, but is it almost the attorney's job to make it appear worse than it is so that there's some, you know, leniency for their client in, in the courtroom? But what, what do you think is happening here? Absolutely. I think that, you know, transport is horrible. Well, it's what is what Webster just said. Transport's always horrible. It's never good. Um, I think that these bullet points are somewhat exaggerated. I, I I don't doubt that the ambulance was called. There should be records for that. There's no question about it. But look, uh, she's old. You know what I mean? It, it's just the reality of it. She's an older woman. And so she could be somewhat frail. Uh, that doesn't. And so the, the the distance could be tougher in the transport, could be tougher for her than it might be for, you know, a 25 year old or it might be tougher than it was for her son, you know, Charlie. It might be tougher. But nevertheless, I think that the distance in the travel is tough in itself. I think that this is 100% exaggeration. Um, Donna tried to flag the officers because she needed restroom and a stop. You know, it, it, she tried to flag the officers down. I think that that's exaggerated. Um, it, it, most likely, I doubt she was transported in a bus. It was probably a van or a vehicle is what she was transported in. Um, and so this whole idea of her having to flag and not being able to get the officer's attention and going four to five hours without them checking on her. Look, those officers have a job and that job is to get Donna safely 
from Miami to Leon County. If something happens, no one is going to be more upset at themselves than those officers because their jobs are going to be on the line. And so this whole idea that they went four to five hours without checking on the inmate they have that they're responsible for is nonsensical. Uh, Becky Ireland, I've, I've not confirmed this real quick, Stephen. I'll let you jump in. FOIA requests show that Donna was given two complete jail outfits, including underwear, so she has no reason to be naked in her cell other than by choice. So not sorry for her. There's not going to be a, a lot of people too sympathetic. Go ahead, Stephen. You know, kind of going back to what I was saying with the security, though, like, you know, think about it. And, and there have been instances where things like this have happened. I, I mean, I'm not saying that necessarily it would be realistic with Donna, but the officers have to treat all of them the same. Every transport's the same to them. If, if the you're transporting an inmate and they're like, hey, can you pull over right here? Well, I mean, of course, you're not going to pull over right here for all they know that that's exactly where they've staged, you know, the the some people that are going to come try to bust out the inmate, you know, free the inmate from custody. So, you know, even if they she did try to flag them down and it's not that necessarily she didn't that they didn't hear her, they they would have ignored her. You know, she, you're not going to dictate the terms of your transport. Um, that's the, that's the the. It's the necessary reality of trans secure transport. Um, Lewis, I asked Stephen this, and then I, you came on a little late. Do you think Wendy's uh, in serious trouble here? Do you think that this this is going to continue with a, ultimately an indictment of her at some point? I think so. I think that I, I think so. I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful. I think that honestly, I think it's probably going to get. I'm probably going to jump ahead. But I think that honestly, I, I have a different take on this stuff. I think the jail is um, unintendedly hindering the prosecution of Wendy. Now, that's a big statement to make. I think that essentially what we know from this case is that Wendy, uh, Charlie, Donna, they love the phones and they love to burn them up. And so right now, I think Donna in the jail not giving Donna access to a phone, they're limiting the treasure trove of evidence that the state would have, you know, that might that might lead to Donna, that might, excuse me, that might lead to Wendy. We saw that as soon as Charlie got arrested and convicted, he was on a phone with his mom. And then all kinds of great evidence came out of those phone calls. And so we can imagine what kind of great evidence might come out of the phone calls that Donna's going to make if she's allowed to make them. And I think you see that, which is why I think that's why the state is, you know, if you read the end of the motion, on some places it says that the state doesn't object and the state consents and the state agrees. I think that Georgia um, and Sarah Dugan know that there's some great evidence they're missing out on because Donna, Donna's not on the phone. Speaking of the phones, um, Stephen, to you, we know that Donna's phone was seized and Harvey's tablet and phone were seized as well. Um, it's my opinion, no one else but mine, that that is going to be really problematic. And I speak. Uh, about that because I have an 84 year old mother and she would never know how to manage that phone with text and email. My mother has like 175,000 unread emails I saw one time and she's still <laughs> using AOL, by the way. Love my dear mom. <laughs> but my <laughs> but my point is this. Um, could the could the entire trajectory, I mean, could everything just implode for the Adelsons if there is stuff on those phones, on those tablets uh, that was said between, let's say, Wendy and Donna or Harvey and Donna or any, you know, any variation of that? It was my same exact thought, Joel, you know, it, for every reason you just stated. And on top of that, because she thought she was getting away, right? Like mm -hmm. she had this false sense of security that she was about to go wheels up to Dubai, right? So I'm hoping that that's the case. You know, I've heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but I have heard that maybe the phone was locked and there could, maybe that could present a problem uh, for breaking into the phone. <clears throat> but I feel the same way. You know, I, the stress of everything, the age, the recklessness. I mean, the phone calls were getting more and more reckless there at the end. The flight, the one-way ticket. Um, it's hard not to believe that if they get in there, they're not going to find something that wasn't deleted. Uh, Lewis, this is an interesting comment from Greg Gregory Worth. Can you imagine the mental jolt that must have taken place in Donna's mind going from living in a million dollar condominium with untold amounts of money to a jail cell? We, by the way, did an Adelson South Florida family tour. We went to 
the high rise, the icon that they were living in where apartment started around one and a half, two million dollars. Uh, we went to Charlie's house. Uh, you can find it on our YouTube channel. You know, people go to jail. They do stupid things. Is it particularly hard, do you think, for Donna Adelson, not only the age, but just the lifestyle that she was accustomed to? It is such a stark contrast. Uh, do you think that it is extra difficult for her in this case? I think it's I think it's it's impossible for her to even imagine. I think that every single day her mind is unraveling. And I can't say, you know, I'm not God, but I can't say she doesn't deserve it. Um, I think that I, you have to understand jail's a hard place to be. I, I'm in the jail once or twice a week and I don't like going to visit as a lawyer not because I have to walk. I have to get locked in and I don't like to go visit a lawyer because I have to get locked in. It's a part of my job. And I, of course, want to see my clients. But for Donna, you have to understand where Donna is. And I've been to the pod where she is. It is not a good pod. The pod that she's in, if you can imagine, it's fenced. There's fencing all around, right? And so it's not just the pod. The bars, there's fencing because even when the inmates are walking out, the normal the normal pods at the top rack, the top, top level, there's a bar, um, a rail. But in the mental health pod where she, in the secure pod where she's being held, that uh, attached to that rail is fencing that goes to the ceiling to prevent inmates from jumping off. And so if you can imagine jail being bad, where she is, is 10 times worse. Whatever whatever cell you imagine, it's worse for where she is. Um, it, it's horrible. And so before you even get to the conditions of her cell, the pod is horrible. Um, the cell is worse. And I, when I can tell you, the smell, it smells horrible. Mm. It smells like, um, urine and feces mixed together. It's a mm. disgusting smell. It, it, I can smell it walking down the hallway before I get there. And so when you're talking about where she's in, I mean, it's horrible. And so you're talking about going from the icon to a place that smells like urine and feces. You can't imagine how bad it is for her. And it's not to say, look, I think that Chief Lee and uh, um, Chief Mack, they run a good jail. At the, at, I know them both. They run a good jail. But in her pod, you have inmates who are defecating on themselves and, 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 and picking up, you know, picking up their feces and throwing it at officers and wiping it on windows. And so it, it's nothing they can do to stop the smell. It's impossible. And so she's there's no way to understate how bad it is, especially uh, in the pod that she's in. I mean, it's it's I can tell you, I have to hold my nose and try to. When I walk out, I take the hand sanitizer and try to get the scent out of my nose because of how bad it is. And so I can tell you no question that um, it, it's it's worse. Her her pod is worse than whatever you're imagining as far as a jail pod. It's worse than what you can imagine. Yeah, and I'm sure. glad you brought that up because, uh, you know, we when we think of it, we kind of look at it either two dimensionally or one dimensionally. But there's that odor. Um and it's it's just it's just horrific. And I've heard those stories and it's just it's it's mind blowing. But if you commit a crime, that's where you end up. And that's why I say uh, it should be um, a deterrent. But for a lot of people, it is not. Stephen, back to the issues of these phone seizures. Can you just tell us a kind of inside baseball and then we'll get back to this motion. Um, but as it pertains to these devices themselves, What's going on now behind the scenes? Are there, you know, techs, people with the Tallahassee Police Department that are into digital forensics that are going through these as we speak to, to find out what information is on there? How do they know, you know, where to look, what to look at, and how long does the process take? Well, and that's a that's a tough question to answer. I wish um, I've got a friend named John Sawicki who does a lot of forensic stuff and. I wish that he could be here. You, you might want to put him on one night just to really see if he could walk you through that. But, you know, the, with every iteration of iPhone that comes out, you know, the security becomes more and more intense and more and more secure. And law enforcement is always playing catch up in that regard. I don't know what version of iPhone she had, um, but I, you know, there's some information out there and some my wife is she's very in, well informed on things like that. And she's got significant concerns that it might be difficult uh, to get in and. Um, so it's uh, but you know, here's what I'll say. The Tallahassee Police Department, you know, you saw um, the forensic 
testimony that came in from the Tallahassee Police Department. Um, they have top flight forensic folks working there. And uh, if it can be done, they can do it. And if they can't do it, you've got the federal government and all the resources they have at their disposal to help them. Um, and I think it just depends on basically what platform uh, they had, they were using as to how far up the, uh, the, the, the chain of resources they will have to reach. But I have no doubt in this case here, given, you know, the, the work that is put in, they are going to make sure that they do it with, you know, the most effectiveness that they can do it with. Yeah. I, I can only imagine what Wendy Adelson um, is feeling right now with that long arm of the law hovering over her shoulder and it could tap on that shoulder at any time to you, Lewis, back to, uh, the, the, this particular, uh, motion that we're talking about right now, we'll get back into some of the details, but what are we going to see in court as it relates to this motion? You said the dynamic is going to change as a result of it. So is judge, Ever I don't even know if it's going to be judge Everett. I guess it, it might not be, but uh, whoever the judge is, how, how do they, um, kind of deconstruct this motion in court come Monday? I think it's going to be interesting because essentially, if you read the motion, it seems to me like what's, what was surprising when I read the motion was um, the fact that the state was having some, it seems like that the state agreed with her defense attorney and that the state in some instances supported her defense attorney and was contacting the jail on behalf of the defense to try to help get contact with Donna. If you read the motion where it says, you know, the state and the defense have tried um, to no avail. And so that was surprising. And so I think that in court, this is going to be interesting because the court's going to want to know what what the state agrees with and what the state disagrees with. Um, and if you read the end of the motion, obviously the state objects to, um, you know, house arrest. But in several other cases in a motion, it indicates the state does not object and the state defers to the court. Uh, and when the state attorney says she defers to the court, that's the state trying to say they essentially don't object and they agree with the argument, but they're not going to come out and formally agree. And so they're going to leave it to the court's discretion. I think what's going to be interesting, Joel, is that, you know, Webster will tell you, we hear all the time, the sheriff runs the jail. And so the court has very little power over the administration of the jail. The court has very little power over where Donna is actually housed inside the jail. Um, I don't believe that the case law would allow uh, Judge Everett, uh, 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 Judge Baker, um, Judge Serstrom, or whoever hears this motion to direct the jail to house her in a certain pod. I don't think the case law would give them that authority. I think that, of course, Sheriff McNeil's a stand up sheriff and he might acquiesce out of respect. But all the time I go to the I go to the court. I, I was in court once and uh, the the court wanted the, an inmate transfer and the jail said because of the inmate had done some behavior he wasn't being transferred and the court wanted him transferred and the, and the court had to say look well, i don't run the jail we have to reset this date and so it's gonna be an interesting dynamic to see how much deference does the judge give to the jail and how active does the judge go into trying to manage the jail and manage donna's treatment i think it's going to be really interesting i do think the court is going to ensure like Steven Webster said earlier, that of course it's important that Donna had the chance to communicate with a lawyer. You know, it's a it goes back to the foundation of our country that you have to have access to counsel. And so I think there's no question she's going to have act. The court's going to ensure that um, she has access to counsel. And what's interesting, and I'll pass the I'll, I'll defer to you after this, is that you know Leon County uses tablets, and so what that means is inmates are assigned tablets that they take into their cell. And so this isn't like a place where um, in some places, they get 15 minutes on a phone or 20 minutes on a phone, or you can only call at four o'clock. It's not how it works in Leon County. Once you have that tablet, you can talk as much as you want on that tablet as long as you have the money to do it, which clearly in this case, I think she does. And so the real question is going to be is, for me, does this hearing result in Donna getting a tablet? And if Donna leaves with a tablet, I think for her, that's a win because on this tablet, you can watch movies, um, you can watch videos, you have limited access to the internet. I mean, it's a, it, a lot of, a lot, it's a big benefit to inmates. So the real question is to me is, will she leave this hearing with a tablet? 
it sounds like she's losing her mind. And to be fair, I think I would be too, because she's literally just in her head all day long in this horrible environment. Um, this part of the motion talks about cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, Steve Webster, some jail staff have treated Donna with cruelty. She has been denied her necessary blood pressure medication, and she's been prevented from showering for days at a time. In 15 days at Leon County Jail, Donna was permitted to call her husband Harvey once for approximately five minutes while guards stood watch. It was only with the help and intervention of the state that this call took place. Donna has not been permitted to call her counsel at all. You brought this up earlier. How does counsel know this if she hasn't been able to call counsel at all? Your thoughts about this. If this is truly happening, um, is, is this depriving her of her rights? Well, you know, <clears throat> I don't put I don't put a lot of credence or stock in a lot of these statements here, these allegations. Um, have some jail staff treated her, um, you know, cruelly? Well, that you know, that's probably in the eye of the beholder. Um, and you know, when you, when officers are working in a confinement setting, you know, be, becoming friendly with inmates can be a dangerous proposition. Um, so, um, you know, the, dec the decorum that, that Donna is used to, it, it just doesn't exist in a jail setting. Um, you know, as far as, uh, the, the lack of showering, you know, probably, you know, there may be some truth to that. You know, I don't know, I don't know if one shower in 15 days, if, if I'm going to just buy into that, but you know, once again, with showering, you have a new inmate coming in who's a high security risk. You know, they're trying to process her in, evaluate her, monitor her, make sure she's not a suicide risk. You know, lots of things they have to worry about. Um, and frankly, uh, her taking a shower is down on the, the pecking order of importance for them at that, you know, in the first part of her incarceration. You know, when she's first housed there, that's when she poses the greatest risk to herself. Um, mentally, that's where she's, you know, it's, most inmates are at their lowest point when they're first incarcerated. So, you know, that's kind of, that kind of dovetails with the whole security issues that correction officers face just to begin with. Um, you know, as far as the lack of access to a phone to call her husband, I'm going to just, you know, reiterate what Lewis said, please get her on the phone. I, I mean, I will, I will buy her a plan if that's what needs to happen. Let's get her talking as, as soon as possible, please. Um, and, uh, then as far as not talking to her attorney, if there, if there's truth to that, which once again, I can't really, uh, comprehend how this motion was, was cobbled together if there wasn't some contact, but if there is truth to that, and I believe there will be growing pains at the beginning once again, but that does need to be ironed out. And I, I believe it will be ironed out. I, Lewis is 100% correct. You know, the jail is the province of the sheriff and it's the sheriff's responsibility, to make sure that jails are safe and that the inmates can't harm themselves or others. And that's the sheriff's, you know, ominous responsibility that he has to deal with on a daily basis. So, you know, the courts, for good reasons, they defer to the experts on that. But when it comes to, you know, the access to counsel, that's a constitutional issue and a Sixth Amendment issue. And I don't expect Judge Everett uh, to, you know, to tread lightly in regard to that. I think he will ask pointed questions. And if he's convinced that there, you know, are indeed problems there, that he's going to get to the bottom of that and he will make sure that arrangements are made that she can have access to counsel, which needs to happen. You know, the counsel needs, the attorney needs an opportunity to speak to her client and they have a lot of work to do. And um, so I expect that, you know, to the extent that there's truth in that allegation and there may be some at this early stage of the game, you know, it needs to be addressed and I trust that it will be. Uh, there was just a comment up there, uh, Lewis. Uh, the Adelsons were conspicuously absent at Charlie's trial. No family, no one behind him. Yeah. But someone was asking, is there any chance Wendy would be at the sentencing? What say you, Lewis Baptiste? I doubt it. You know, I doubt it. Like I said, I think that they were absent at uh, the trial. They knew the verdict was coming in. They were absent. No one was there, not a single person in the courtroom. We know that they were watching because as soon as it came in, you know, their phone started. He was talking to his mom that night. So I know, we know they were obviously tuned in. I think that they weren't there on purpose. I, I don't imagine. Look, Wendy's for Wendy. That's what Wendy cares about protecting Wendy. We saw that in, in everything we've seen. We know that Wendy's, her bottom line is Wendy. And so um, I think that she's not going to expose herself to anything unnecessarily. And she's definitely not going to do it to support her brother. And so I make a, 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 a fairly healthy wager that, She's not going to be present in the courtroom and, and, and that uh, the father won't be either. Hmm. 
Uh, Stephen Webster, I think this is more in your wheelhouse, probably from Farrow Gam, our friend of the show. What is going to happen to Dan Markell's sons if Wendy goes to jail? We're putting the cart ahead of the horse here, but it's seeming like it could become more and more of a reality. What would that uh, situation look like? These are kids that are now young teens. Uh, they, they And they're smart boys from everything I've heard. They've got to know or have an inkling that things are not right. But what would happen to them potentially? You know, as much as I've longed for the Mark, the Markel family to have access, you know, and Shelly Markel and, and, and her children to have access to their cousins. Unfortunately, um, those children, I believe, have been more than likely brainwashed to believe really terrible things about uh, the Markel family. So, you know, it raises a real concern that with the shock of everything that must already be, they must be confronting right now as young teens. Um, you know, how would the court and our system navigate, you know, what I would hope would be the ultimate reintroduction uh, to the Markel family. Um, but if I'm just being honest here, um, if they were snatched up suddenly and thrust in the middle of the, the Markel family, Shelley Markel, wonderful, beautiful people. But for these poor children who I believe have more than likely been brainwashed into believing that they're, you know, horrible, evil folks. Um, how do you, how do you bridge that gap? Um, and that's a really, you know, tough question. Um, but I do believe that ultimately the courts would move in that direction of probably seeing if, you know, Shelley could take a primary role um, in the care and custody of those children. At least that's what I would hope to see. But obviously the timeline would be incredibly difficult um, and, and, and sensitive. Yes, it's so tragic all around. Uh, I can't keep these guys too much longer, but a couple more things I really want to get to. Uh, this I'll field because I'm the uh, former journalist. Where is Wendy? Press not hounding her. Why not? It's a great question. I mean, the Miami Herald just ran an article. Um, I say it jokingly, but it's nine and a half years too late. They've done some coverage, but very minimal. Uh, and media has not been out there. Uh, the hesitation that I would have to flag down Wendy Adelson is her children. You know, you don't want to drag the children into it. Um, she's terrified out there from everything that I've gathered, uh, keeping a really low profile, uh, you know, wearing hats and staying low key. So um, it's, again, all around a horrific uh, situation. I think the answer to this one, uh, Lewis, will Georgia be the prosecutor for Donna's trial as well? I would think that that is an affirmative, correct? Yes, sir. And I, and I would just say we talk a lot about Georgia and she deserves she deserves every word of praise she gets. But I also want to make it clear, Sarah Dugan is doing a great job also yeah. and that she's been there. She's been here this entire time right alongside Georgia. Um, and Georgia's a great prosecutor. She's hard to keep up with. And I think that the only one of the only other people in that office that could keep up with Georgia is Dugan. And so just want to make sure that, you know, Dugan is doing a great job right with Georgia County. Dugan is getting her due. Thanks to Louis Baptiste uh, at the Leon County jail. This motion, we're almost through it here upon arrival at the Leon County jail. Now we're going back in time a little bit here. Officials put Donna in the infirmary under direct observation. Donna was then placed in a small solitary unit with a toilet, a sink, a mattress on the floor and a dirty blanket. She has requested a book or a Bible but has not been given anything and has been forced to eat her food with her hand. Stephen, um, is this what you would expect? Or again, is this pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable? <clears throat> I, I would expect this. Uh, once again, you have a, uh, an elderly person who has lived a life of privilege um, for you know, many, many decades, who suddenly is thrust into a jail setting. Um, and there's got to be, there has to be almost a presumption that she poses a danger to herself under those circumstances, especially given the gravity of her son's sentencing, which is hanging out there in the balance. Um, the certain Senate life sentence he's facing also certainly given the, her comments on the phone calls where she talked about hurting herself or fleeing, you know, one of the two. So no, they, like Lewis said, they can't put her in an environment where she has unfettered access to things that she could harm herself or others with until they really know that she's stabilized and she's, you know, she's kind of acclimated to her new environment. So it's not, it's not unusual to me. I would expect that. 
uh, one more slide after this. I'm sending Donna Wendy's book. I hear it's torture to read from Jennifer Ray, $5 super sticker. I have no doubt that that's going to happen. Uh, this part of the motion has to do with Donna's medications. A uh, prison official told Donna that Donna is a fancy white lady who murdered her son and now thinks she has rights. The official joke with the other guards about this outside of Donna's door the official said Donna will learn that fancy white lady murders have no rights here and said, do you see where you are and do you see where I am? I am out here because I am not a murderer. Uh, Lewis, this sounds super harsh. Sounds like it's bordering on racism, all of these things. But jail and prison ain't a pretty place and prison guards aren't always the nicest. Is this something that surprises you in any way and or? Does it need to be addressed and stopped if it is happening? I think it's surprising in a sense of, look, I think that, you know, Sheriff McNeil, I really mean it. He runs a good jail. And I don't say that about all jails. You know, Leon County's inmates have tablets. Um, I'm allowed to see inmates when I need to see them. Um, and so it's a pretty, if I have an issue, I call Chief Mack and, he, and I get to him pretty quickly. So it's surprising in that way because they're normally super professional. And obviously, if that's true, it's extremely unprofessional. There's no question about that. Um, at the same time, I would say that there's nothing the court's going to do about it. You know, if, if, if one guard was to make a, when you say official, this isn't somebody, what we call a policymaker. There's no question to me that this is a captain or this is a chief, or this is, you know, the assistant sheriff making these comments. If you believe they're true, they're a guard who was maybe frustrated at the way, at what Donna was demanding, if they're true. And that's a big if. And so, I think there's nothing that's going to be done about it. There's nothing that can be done about it. Um, I think the better question and the real question I've been having, it's a two-part two part question, is one, I think that is Donna setting, is all this her attorney setting up, setting up a, a incompetency defense, right? Which is essentially to argue that Donna doesn't have anything, that she's going crazy, she can't talk to anybody to build up to asking the court to find her incompetent to proceed to trial, right? I, I think that there's a real risk that that's what's really happening here, mm -hmm. that this Miami, the trip to Miami was tough. The road was tough. Leonis County is tough. I think this is all building for the attorney to ask Donna, for the attorney to file a motion asking the court to determine if Donna's competent. Because if the court finds that Donna's not competent to proceed, the court will have to go under a statute to decide if she's if her competency is going to be restored in custody or out of custody. And the court has to evaluate factors. So I think that's what it's leading up to, number one. And number two, it's something you said on our last show together. You said, Joel, you said that Charlie made a humongous mistake by not hiring local counsel, is what you said. And I think that this entire motion sums up to the fact that Donna's making the same mistake. That if she had local counsel. They could pick up the phone and take care of 40 percent of the items in this motion with one phone call. Right. Because of the relationship. And I think that the same mistake you identified uh, that Charlie's made by not having local counsel, it's the same mistake that Donna's making because um, she doesn't have local counsel. They can pick up the phone and call Chief Mack and get Donna on the phone in 10 minutes. You know, she doesn't have that 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 connection because she's from Miami. She doesn't know the players here. I think it's that same mistake. And, and that's a really important distinction. Uh, Catherine, to you, Stephen, I know I know you got to get going in a minute here. Um, people are uh, really engrossed with what both of you guys have to say. Uh, will Donna be allowed to talk to Dan's boys? I hope not. I can't imagine what she might tell them. Uh, Stephen, what about that? If she gets a tablet, can she call Ben and Lincoln potentially? I'm not aware of any prohibition from the court on her having contact with her grandchildren. So, I mean, I think it's a... While it's a harrowing prospect, I think that it's, you know, it's certainly a possible possibility. And at some point it will become a likelihood. I, I you know, once again, going back to the, what I believe the most in, in my heart is that these children have been somewhat uh, brainwashed. Um, you know, they probably are longing to speak to their grandmother. And, and at some point she more than likely will. Um, I don't believe she was ever saying anything healthy to the children when she was free. So I don't have I have no reason to believe she'll say anything healthy to them when she's in custody. So could, I think could the judge just come out on Monday potentially and say uh, Donna Adelson is no longer allowed to have contact with her grandchildren? Can you say that? I don't believe that would really. I, I mean, 
I'd have to do some research to, you know, give you a, a 10 foot, you know, a 10 toed firm flat footed opinion on it. But I don't believe that that would be appropriate here. I don't believe the judge would have jurisdiction that would extend that far, um, especially in a bail type situation. Um, you know, he has a duty right now. The court's duty right now is to ensure that the inmate appears in court and that she doesn't pose a harm uh, to the community. Um, so that's why, you know, not having contact with co-defendants and things like that, the court's jurisdiction extends that far to make sure that they don't plot or scheme uh, to engage in any further criminality. Uh, but having contact with her grandchildren, I don't know what kind of logical connection uh, or nexus the court could draw to the case and to the court's primary responsibilities right now of protecting the public or ensuring that she appears in court, how that could dovetail with an order she can't talk to her grandchildren. I don't know if Lewis has a different opinion, but that's my thought. Yeah, I, I actually have an interesting thing. I don't have a different opinion, but I had a, I had a case not long ago. Webster knows the case where I represented a doctor, um, an MD, who was accused of assaulting his wife. And uh, part of the conditions of the criminal case were that he had no contact with his own children. Um, and those in his children were about the same age as, you know, uh, Professor Markell's children, dance kids. And I think what was interesting in that case was that he had a family law court order that gave him peaceful contact with the kids. And he had a criminal court order that said he couldn't have any contact. And so the, the criminal court order trumped and he could not have any contact or he would have violated the conditions of his release. And subsequently, they even placed it at made it a condition of his probation. And so um, I think the state, because the children are essentially, you know, these are Dan's kids. And so in a way, they're victims. You know, they are victims as because, you know, Donna is now accused of being a part of a plot to kill their father. And so I think that the court, when sometimes when the court grants no contact orders, Webster and I see it all the time where the court grants no contact orders that go beyond the victim themselves into their, you know, their survivors in their families. And so could the court, you know, could the court go around and, and try to you know, create a broad no contact order that included these kids possibly. But I agree with Repster. I don't think the court's going to do it in this case. Um, if it's Judge Everett, I don't think it's Judge Everett's style. You know, he's a he's a by the law judge. He wants to do what the law allows. He doesn't want to try to exceed it, doesn't try to want, doesn't want to write new law. And so I don't think that Judge Everett will do it. But I do think it's an interesting question um, is would the state ask for it? That's really to me the better question is at some point, would the state ask for no contact? And I can guarantee you that we know that, um, you know, that Ruth and Phil, they're going to want no contact, that, you know, that's going to be something they request. And under Marcy's law, the state would have to take their request into consideration. So sorry to go so many directions, but it's, this is a real complicated legal issue that is really going to take, you know, some wrangling with the state attorney's office if they make that request. Uh, this is amazing insight. By the way, a programming note tomorrow night, we've got three, count them, three divorce experts coming on to talk about deadly divorces, why Dan Markell and uh, Wendy Adelson divorce turned deadly. We're also looking at a case just across the state up north in Jacksonville of Jared Bridegan and Shanna Gardner, which is sure to be a very high profile case when that goes to trial and other uh, murder for hire plot where the husband was killed eerily similar to the uh, Dan Markell and uh, Adelson story. This this is the final slide in this motion here. To prevent further constitutional violations, Donna respectfully requests this court enjoin the Leon County Jail from subjecting her to her current conditions of confinement and direct the Leon County Jail to place Donna in a unit where she can prepare for trial and speak to her family or conduct an independent psychological evaluation in order to be placed in a different unit of the jail where she can, did I just read the same line twice? I don't know, properly prepare for trial and speak to her family. Alternative, alternatively, this is a big part, she requests to be released on house arrest coupled with standard conditions of pretrial release. Steve Webster, you talked about this. Any chance in hell that she ever gets released to her home. I don't believe that. I don't believe, I, you know, never say never in life. Um, so what, what's the next best thing to never? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I see it. As, once again, she could have had, interestingly enough, even though I still don't think it would have been successful, 
if she, you know, she could have had a kind of a sympathetic, maybe claim uh, that she wasn't a flight risk and that given her, you know, her age and her lack of prior criminal history, yada, 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 uh, she didn't pose a, a risk of harm to the community. The conditions of, you know, of house arrest could be a fix that would ensure that she wouldn't flee and that she also would not pose a risk to society. Um, but once she bought that one way plane ticket to Vietnam, it was over. So that's DOA as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Steve from Bonnie Lee Lopez in Chile, Vermont. What do you think Danny would think of the arrest and the timeline plus the public's outcry? for justice and then we'll get final thoughts and wrap it up um i you know that's that's really that's a heavy question i have I, strangely enough i haven't thought about that um on any level um you know i think he would definitely be um thankful that people cared um but i think he would be so tortured over uh what this all of this has done to his children and is continuing to do to his children that it, I really wonder what he would think ultimately. Um, because although for those of us who are on this side of the aisle, um, you know, we, we feel a sense of satisfaction at Donna's arrest and Charlie's conviction and uh, pending life sentence. Uh, those, I don't imagine those children have the same view and I don't know what this is going to do uh, to the tragedy that's, the unspeakable tragedy that has already befallen them. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how Dan would feel, but I think he would be grateful for people caring. I do believe that. Louis Baptiste uh, pinch hitting for us in the last uh, moment. And I uh, can't ask for two better guests. And these guys, uh, you see the COE saying, please hit the like button. Uh, we're going to be back with a special show uh, tomorrow night. The COE just took off my question that I was going to end with here. She's been doing that lately. I don't know why the COE, the chief of everything, thinks that she can take away my comments. But here's the comment. I think it was. There we go. Uh, Lewis, how does you're you're uh, you're like a scholar, Lewis. I have a feeling that one day you're going to be teaching at FSU. How does presumption of innocence counter the crimes and her attempt to flee when asking to move? It's an interesting question because tough to presume that she's innocent. So how did the, how does, how did these two worlds collide and your final thoughts on this evening? So I just want to answer the question. I think that she's going to remain the presumption of innocence. That presumption of innocence is a veil and it stays on her. It's going to stay on her until the jury removes it. God willing and finds her guilty. I think that um, her attempt to flee is going to show consciousness of guilt, but consciousness of guilt is different. It consciousness of guilt is a tool that the state is going to use to overcome the presumption of, in, in, of innocence. And so that presumption stays and the, you know, uh, the conscience of guilt, her fleeing the one way Vietnam ticket, her being with her husband, all that is going to be evidence, amazing evidence that the state is going to use to overcome um, the presumption of, of innocence by proving her guilt and showing that the consciousness of the guilt that existed. Um, to answer the question, I think that my final comments would be that, you know, thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you for everyone who's watching. I got to know Dan for a little time in my life. And the short time I knew him, he made a profound impact. You know, I'm here today. I'm working with Stephen Webster I'm in my practice, taking care of my family and my extended family because, you know, Dan Markell bet on me. Um, he bet on a person he knew for four months um, and, and he took a bet on me in a big one, you know, and recommended me. Um, and, and without an interview, which is why Webster and I, who's, we're brothers, you know, we don't look like it, but we are. Um, we're connected because Dan Markell made it happen. And so uh, I say thank you. You know, thank you because thank you to him. But thank you for everyone on this show and for you for keeping his memory alive, for not making this not another senseless murder that everyone forgets about. Um, so I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My one ask is that we pray. I'm a firm believer in God and Jesus. And I just think that Dan Markell loved his boys. You know, in class, he called them Lincoln and Ben Ben. You know, his nickname was Ben Ben. That's what he called them. And I remember it from class. And so I know that more than anything, he would want his boys to be, you know, happy, blessed, you know, surrounded by love and prayer. And so I think that 
you know, everyone who is a believer can just pray for his boys, for Lincoln and Ben Ben. I haven't, I haven't seen them in years. I haven't seen a picture of them in years. Um, and I still pray for them. I pray their peace. I pray they grow up knowing that their father loved them. They never forget it. And they know that, you know, that they were loved, not just by their mom or not just by those people, but that their father loved them. And there's nothing in the world. You know, during trial, they asked about a million dollars. They couldn't have given Dan Markell $10 million to give up his custody rights for his kids. And so I hope they, I hope that I pray that they know that that they were loved by their father and they had a father who loved them more than he loved any degree, any accolade, uh, any doctorate. He loved his kids. Catherine writes, uh, Lewis, maybe Dan's good friends and close students could write a compilation of stories about him to be given to the boys when they are of age. Hopefully one day Lewis can sit down with Ben and Lincoln and tell them all the great stories uh, about Dan Markell. Stephen Webster was Dan Markell's post-divorce attorney. He testified in Charlie Adelson's trial, and uh, he's a mensch, as they say down here in Miami, for coming on last second. Uh, your final thoughts tonight, Stephen? And once I just want to, you know, echo what Lewis said. Thank you, you know, thank you for caring. Thank you for the energy you put towards trying to help the Markell family achieve justice. Uh, please, everybody, go out and buy Ruth's book. I'm, I'm. I'm still in the midst of reading it, um, and it's important because it really does reveal a side of the victimhood that you most people would never comprehend. Thank goodness they never would comprehend it. But I would just like to say one thing. Um, you know, I want to say thank you to Dan out there in the universe. Um, you know, as Lewis just stated, I, he introduced me to Lewis um, about 10 years ago almost. We're knocking on the 10-year uh, anniversary of our brotherhood. Um, I, uh, I had a case, I needed some help. I said, Hey, I need a, I need a law clerk who can come in and can take, take hold of some materials can read them, assimilate them, digest them, call out the important information and give it to me. I don't have time to hold their hand. I'm a sole practitioner. I, you know, I need a go getter and a self starter. And he said, I know just the man. And he gave me the number to Louis Jean Baptiste. Um, and it changed my life forever. It changed my children's life, my family's life as a whole, uh, because he did introduce me to somebody that I love like a brother and will go to the grave loving like a brother. And I believe I was meant to know in this life. And three weeks later, uh, Dan was killed me to Lewis. And so, I, you know, I really do believe that 10 years later, um, hopefully we honor Dan's memory with our relationship, our, our brotherhood and the work we do. Uh, but no matter what, I will, I will eternally be grateful uh, to you, Dan Markell for introducing me to Louis Jean Baptiste. Uh, you both are a testament to Dan Markell's legacy, your brotherhood, as you call it. Um, it goes to show that love and uh, light always beats out darkness and evil. Could not have two better best guests. Thank, thanks to both Stephen and Louis. We'll be back tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, with a special show on divorce, deadly divorces. Till then. Love you, America. Love you, Tallahassee. Love you, Dan Markell.